It's true that rangeland ecosystems evolved with fire, but fire is one of our biggest challenges for rangeland management. In our modern era, we've changed the way that fire works in systems, so it's, it's quite a, a management challenge. In this uh, presentation in integrated rangeland management, we're going to talk about grazing before and after a fire and how, how grazing and range management play into the equation. So we'll talk a little bit about before the fire, how, how does grazing and, and our management practices affect what the ecosystem looks like, which could affect during the fire, how, the fi how hot the fire is, its extent, its flame length. And then we'll talk about what do we know, how long to wait, especially for grazing or other management practices after a fire. So before and after the fire. When thinking about the effect of grazing, it is important to think about how grazing might change the plant before a fire. So here's some work done by Dr. Kirk Davies out of the Burns ARS lab. Here's some, the pictures he took here is really clear. The top one is an ungrazed perennial grass plant and you can see the amount of biomass right in the crown there and down below is a grazed plant where you, uh, the effect of grazing is apparent in that it has removed that, um, that the, the dead material right at the crown. So one of the things that grazing does is it has uh, an effect on the accumulation of biomass and litter. And in Davy's work, he found that the distribution of litter uh, in ungrazed cr uh, perennial crowns of grasses was three times greater than in grazed plants. And that also because of the way the, the, the litter is in the crown, it, it's taller. So there's an increased litter depth. And he also looked at community responses and attributes a lot of that to that uh, the litter that builds up in the ungrazed areas. So let's take a look uh, at this work by Dr. Davies. So Dr. Davies and his colleagues uh, had an interesting uh, study because they looked at ungrazed areas and burned them, and then they looked at some areas that were grazed and burned them. He, they also compared ungrazed and grazed areas that were not burned. And they, they had three different sites. And, and the reason that this uh, was able to be done was because there were some old exclosures at the ARS lab in Burns. Uh, they were put up in 1936. And at that time, there was no difference in the plant density between the exclosures or the grazed areas. And then in the ensuing years, cattle grazed at moderate levels, estimated at about 40%. And in 1992 and 93, Dr. Davies and his team went back into those paired plots of grazed and ungrazed and they looked at cover and biomass, and then they burned half of the areas. So in 93, there's, uh, there were plots that were burned. And then 12 to 14 years later, so more than a decade later in 2005 and 2007, they went back to look at the estimated cover and biomass of those burned and unburned, grazed and ungrazed areas. When you look at what happened before they set the fire in 93, so their data from 92 and 93, what we see is there's less perennial grass, but later um, examination of that showed that most of that um, lesser amount of grass was because the grazing, the grazed plots, had removed that accumulation of litter. So the difference here in cover has a lot to do with a difference in the amount of standing litter. On the other hand, there was not uh, any difference of litter on the ground. So there was less perennial grass, less total herbaceous areas, and that's mostly because there was less litter on the grazed area, that standing litter. There was also larger gaps between the plants, and we talked about this earlier as potentially affecting continuity of fuels. So what did that lesser amount of litter do after the fire? Let's look at the, the plant response. What we found was Sandberg bluegrass uh, was less in the area that was not grazed before the burned burning. So in other words, both Sandberg bluegrass and other perennial grasses were more abundant in the area that had been grazed before the fire than the area that wasn't grazed. Again, this is this is 10 to this is 12 to 14 years after the fire. And what's really interesting is look at the cheatgrass. The cheatgrass is radically more in the area that was not grazed before the fire and much less in the area that was grazed before the fire. So this defies logic just a little bit. Most people think of grazing, well, grazing is a stress on plant, but most people focus on that, that the stressful effects of grazing. And one side effect was that there was not as much litter in the grazed plot. So when the fire came through, it was probably not as intense. Now they did not uh, study intensity in this uh, study. They didn't examine intensity, but subsequent research that Dr. Davies and his team have done have showed that that, that literally does increase the heat and, and the, uh, the nature of the fire. So bottom line, 
plots that were grazed before a fire had more perennial grass a decade later and the plots that were grazed uh, before the fire also had less cheat grass a decade later. It's always great when pictures are more effective than, um, than the uh, data are. And here's an example. Here's some pictures 15 years after the fire. On the left is the area that was grazed and then burned. On the right is the area that was ungrazed and then burned. And you see the massive amount of cheatgrass in the site that was not grazed before the fire. So the results, there was a substantial cheatgrass invasion following the fire in the ungrazed area. There was less perennial grass in the exclosures or ungrazed areas post-burn compared to those that were moderately grazed. And there were few difference in, differences in the grazed and ungrazed plots that were not burned. Now let's talk a little bit after the fire. One thing we know is if you think to kind of take a historical perspective, you've got a fire and then there's this one year after a fire and then slowly two, three years later, the vegetation starts to reoccur. Now the question is like, what is it gonna to take to get that vegetation back to uh, good conditions or pre-fire conditions? One thing we know that affects the community after fires. Animals are drawn to those recently burned areas. And again, it's probably because we've removed all that standing dead litter. So animals are drawn to those areas. Uh, what are, uh, how we use that in management, this is actually used to help distribute animals across landscape. We've talked about this previously that patch burning can be one thing that can be used to, to draw animals to an area. So we know this is effective. It, it, it's, it's how animals are, are drawn to higher quality areas because they're greener. The most uh, clear example of this was done by uh, David Ganskop and Dr. Ganskop and his colleagues, again, at the Burns ARS lab in Burns, Oregon. They did an interesting study. This graph that you see on the left in 2004 had 20 uh, collars on the cattle where they, um, th they were GPS collars that looked at where animals were grazing. And on that pasture, you see that animals liked water. They congregated along around water and they spent a lot of time on the lower elevation and not up on the high buttes or anything. And then there was a, there was a low flat area um, up in the upper left end that is, uh, it's highlighted with kind of a purple color. After they took the cows off, they went in and they did a prescribed burn. So that purple area is where that prescribed burn was done in, in 2004. And then he went back and looked at the cow locations in 2005, and here's what he found. Of course, the cattle were drawn to the area that had been burned. And so about 39% of the uh, locations were in the burned area compared to uh, in, after the burn compared to before the burn, which was only a, a one tenth of 1% 1 in 2004. So animals really started using this area that had been burned. No surprise, but one of the first really uh, clearly documented cases. Now let's look at the plant response after fire. What happens to the plants if they're grazed after fire. That's a concern. Many uh, federal lands, well, most federal lands have a policy about how long to wait after fire. And here's why animals are drawn to those areas. We know that animals are, but it's because we've removed that um, standing dead litter and the, the quality of the plants is higher. So this was a study done by Dr. Cook way back in the 60s. And if you look at the burn site, the hatched bars, the crude protein is much higher in those sites one and two years after a fire compared to um, the unburned site. And that would be true for the blue bunch wheatgrass, perennial grasses and perennial forbs. So that's why animals are drawn to those sites. Another reason animals are drawn to those sites is because they have more uh, forage. The burned sites, and this is in, this was on sites that had Wyoming uh, big sagebrush. So this was done by uh, Cook in 1994. And when they removed mountain big sagebrush, the plants, the total herbaceous plants, and whether that be blue bunch wheatgrass, perennial grasses, perennial forbs, all those plants all started growing more because now the competition from the shrubs was removed and the burn sites had a, a greater, twice as much herbaceous forbs, or I'm sorry, twice as much her herbaceous plants. And much of that was blue bunch wheatgrass, twice as much blue bunch wheatgrass in the site that was burned than the site that was not burned. So there's increased forage quantity after the fire. So both quality and quantity of grazed plants increases. Of course, what's not shown here is that the shrubs decreased.
That work was done by Harness and Murray way back in the 70s, and this research was done at the Dubois Experiment Station. And so now you can see that in a little different way. There was a fire in 2000, in, in 1936, and right after the fire, they went to, I'm sorry, the yeah, the fire was done, it was in 36, and they looked at what was the change before and after the fire. So if uh, before the fire was 100%, you see in 37, radical decrease in all plants, Right after fire, we usually see a, just a, a slowing of vegetation. It doesn't matter whether it's shrubs, total vegetation, forbs, or grasses. But look what was the first to start to come back by 39. Quite a lot of grasses coming and total forbs are much increased. The, the shrubs still are not very present on the site. And in fact, the shrubs took uh, almost 30 years to get up to a level that was close to before the fire. And in the interim, the grasses and forbs took advantage of the, the decreased competition from shrubs, and they really came in. So uh, ranching enterprises were um, guilty of using a lot of fire and herbicides to kill shrubs, especially in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And, and of course, the reason they did it is because it uh, created more grass. And of course, grass is what um, livestock eat, and the grass and forbs are really what the ranchers were trying to get at. We don't see much of this anymore because of concerns about sagebrush ecosystems, but certainly studies like this promoted the idea that if you got rid of those shrubs, in this case sagebrush, it, you would benefit the population or the production of grasses and forbs, which would in turn benefit livestock production. So how long should we wait to start grazing after a fire? Well, there's a lot of concerns about recovery of the plant community after the fire. It is important that the plants have time to recover because fire is certainly a stress. We want to wait long enough, but how long is that? Is, is the rest after fire really ecologically significant? It depends on some conditions before the fire happened and the nature of the fire. So we need to know when is it important or ecologically significant. And we don't want to do it unnecessarily, rest unnecessarily, because in systems that have cheatgrass, often by not grazing the site, we're giving an advantage to the cheatgrass and um, and, and the perennial grasses uh, might be damaged. So one of the ideas we talk, discussed from the presentation on grazing and cheatgrass is that early spring uh, grazing could be effective to suppress the cheatgrass. So maybe by waiting, we're just creating a situation where we wait we get more cheatgrass, we may get more fire, and then we wait and we get more cheatgrass. So it can be a vicious cycle, and this cycle has been seen in several um, BLM allotments. I've, I've seen uh, examples of this south of about Twin Falls and other places in the Great Basin. So to look at this question about how long should we wait for grazing after fire, we had an opportunity, we being uh, my student, Lavina Rossell England, uh, and I in, in the early 2000s, in 2001 to 2004, she looked at a plant community that was mostly three-tip sage, but a few other sages, and an understory of really healthy bunch grasses and forbs. This is a site near Dubois, Idaho, where there's winter snow and rain. It's pretty dry from 8 to 10 inches per year. We were working there on some other uh, projects, and in July 31st, 2000, a fire came through. It started on the railroad, and it came through, and these are some pictures that we took from where we were up at the headquarters, and you can see it was just racing across the landscape. And uh, it is a landscape dominated by sagebrush, not so much right where my camera was, but further down it was. The fire burned uh, 474 hectares, and um, that got us thinking. Maybe this was an opportunity to think about how long should we wait before grazing after fire. So we implemented a study with sheep grazing one, two, and three years after a fire, and we wanted to see um, if it was important for sagebrush rec recruitment. Uh, other studies have shown that if you want to get sagebrush back in the ecosystem, you have to reduce the competition, or it's helpful to reduce competition from grasses and forbs. And we know that sheep eat grasses and forbs, so one of our hypotheses was that maybe sagebrush would be more abundant if they were on grazed sites. We also were wondering if grazing in the spring after, after fires, one, two, or three years after a fire, would reduce the invasive annual grasses. And then we did definitely want to see the persistence of native forbs and grasses. So our study was uh, fully replicated for replications of several treatments, fall one, two, and three years after a fire, and then fall waiting till the second year and grazing the third year after the fire. And then the third treatment was fall and then waiting three years after the fire. We also grazed in the spring two years and three years after a fire, in the spring three years after a fire, and there was a no, a no grazing control.
And here's what we found. Uh, one thing that happened was there was no difference in annual grasses in our study. This study was not uh, heavily dominated by cheatgrass. There was uh, quite a bit of uh, Japanese brome, some cheatgrass, but before the fire there was not a lot of annual grasses, and after the fire there was not a lot of annual grasses. One of the things that happened was the winter after the fire, uh, it was a really cold and dry winter, so the, the, it wasn't a very good seed bed to get the annual grass started. So we didn't have any effect of grazing on annual grasses. We also didn't have any effect of grazing on forbs, whether we waited one, two, three years after the fire and whether we grazed um, in the fall or in the spring. In none of those cases did we have an influence of grazing on the forbs after the fire. The influence of grazing on grasses was seen, though. Uh, if you look at the overall amount of, uh, of or the overall effect of grazing on perennial grasses, just in general, all the perennial grasses, including Sandberg bluegrass, even though that looks like there's a lot of difference between change in cover on the no grazing and on the, the grazed plots, which were fall and spring grazed, uh, there actually is no difference there statistically. Part of the reason is if you look at those percent covers, that was five or six percent cover. So uh, there was a lot of variation that we weren't able to account for. So it just hints that there might be a trend that grazing did slow or reduce the amount of cover after the fire. So the change in cover from right after the fire to one, two, or three years after the fire. However, blue bunch wheatgrass did have a small effect. So there was a little bit more uh, blue bunch wheatgrass. It came back more quickly in the ungrazed uh, controls than it did on the grazed controls. It didn't seem to matter much whether it was grazed in the fall or spring. So the bottom line is how long should we, should we graze after fire? Well, it really depends. In the study that we did in Dubois, we didn't have a very large effect because maybe the community was in really good shape before the fire. What was the pre-fire community like? That can affect uh, the response. The fire severity, we don't really know how, how severe or how hot that fire was. In our case, we didn't have a lot of invasive annuals. In other cases, rest after fire could really promote weeds. So no matter what uh, the answer is uh, it's important to take this question seriously because it, it causes great hardship for land managers and livestock owners. Uh, if, a, if a site does not need to be rested, if, it, if it's ecologically okay to go in, then there's no reason to wait. There are actually some downsides to waiting, the, the, the risk of weeds and the hardship to land managers and owners. So you also might be just creating more fuel loads for subsequent fires. So it's not a question to be taken lightly. And at least our research suggests that just not grazing is not always the answer. Another, the last little piece to this is to think about grazing or livestock as a restoration tool. We, we know from what we've talked about before in this class that grazing certainly has effects on plants. Herbivory, the removal of the biomass, it has a physical impact. There's deposition of, uh, of, of nutrients from fecal material. There's also a transport of seeds through um, connection onto the in, con, uh, passage through the animal, but also attachment to the seed to the of the seeds to the to the coat of the animal. So we know that grazing has effects. The question is, could we use those effects, those physical impacts? in a way to turn livestock into a tool for restoration. I would argue we could. We could use herbivory to reduce competition of weeds, for example. Uh, we could use that physical impact to create a seed, seed bed, and that's been used in some cases. Actually, there's some very good success stories where they were trying to reestablish seeds on mined lands, and they used livestock to push those seeds into the ground and had quite success. There's not much done on deposition of seeds, but, but maybe we could use livestock for seed dispersal. Right now, once a seed goes through the digestion tract, most of the time it's reduced uh, in viability. There are some seeds that actually do become more viable after passage through, this, through the digestive tract. But maybe there's ways we could actually use that passage through the digestive tract and then deposition in a nice nutrient pile uh, to promote seeds uh, being uh, created a seed bed and, and, and adding seeds to a situation after fire. So these are kind of hypothetical, but we're learning a lot about the effects of grazing. We should start to think about those in terms of opportunities for restoration. So how long should we wait after a fire? It depends. Bottom line is it depends on the community before the fire. 
the fire intensity, and then the weather after fire. How moist was it in the spring? How good were the conditions for growing? So I don't have a great answer for you here, uh, but those are the balls to keep your eye on. Those are a few tips for range management before and after a fire.